Now I'm thrilled to introduce Sharon Mears, a former managing director at Goldman Sachs, who together with co-author Joanna Strober has figured out how husbands, wives, and kids all thrive when couples share equally as breadwinners and caregivers. After interviewing hundreds of parents and employers and doing a great deal of research, Sharon and Joanna have put together their book, Getting to 50-50. The book has been an inspiration to me as a working mom, and I'm grateful to have Sharon speak here at Google today. Sharon speaks frequently to professional organizations about work-life balance issues, a topic that we value here at Google. I'll let Sharon tell you the rest, and now introducing Sharon Mears. Sure. Thanks so much, Stacy. Uh, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I have to say I am particularly honored to be back here at Google. Uh, Google was, in fact, the site of our very first book talk back in March. And uh, in fact, many Google uh, employees have been particularly insightful and thoughtful advisors to us in the uh, three plus years it took to research and pull this book together. So um, again, I am very interested in um, what we're going to do today, which is really the project of the book, which is to share some information and talk together about how we might collectively change the dynamics and the framing of the discussion on work and family. One of the things that we've found, we've now been wandering around the country for a little over three months, and we've spoken to probably 2,000 people on corporate campuses and university campuses. And one of the fun things for us is about half the people who are showing up are guys, which sort of reinforces something that we have had a sense of, which is that men and women share this concern that we need to evolve the way we think about work and family so that men can have the joys of full parenthood and women can have the joys of full careers. So part of the reason we got interested in writing this book was we were sensing that the very nature of the conversation was having some unintended and negative consequences. Uh, back in 2004, Joanna and I were speaking at Stanford Business School at a course called Work and Family, taught by a labor economist there. And uh, we were both struck by the nature of the conversation and the nature of the questions we were getting from students in their late 20s, students who had signed up aiming to be leaders of industry, paying hundreds of thousands of dollars collectively for the right for those seats so that they could pursue those careers. And as they sat in that room thinking how the work part was going to come together with the family part, there was an incredible amount of anxiety. And you can't blame them, one, because it's awfully tough. It's much more tough than it needs to be because the world hasn't evolved in the way many people expected it would. Uh, but the thing that concerned us was there was a sense of um, resignation, as if things might be impossible, that it would be necessary to give up on either a significant portion of career goals or a significant portion of family goals. Uh, and while we see trade-offs every day in our own life, we sense that the level of anxiety was more a function of the misinformation out in the world rather than uh, the function of what we are going to try to do, which is improve the flow of communication about the real facts, the real research, and give uh, put more of a spotlight on the dual career couples who actually are figuring this out so that we can all think about how this can help us and apply in our own lives. To take it back another step, uh, I was asked to speak at a women's leadership conference at a very competitive university where a couple hundred women competed for 40 slots to come in the week before school started to hear from various different leadership coaches. And I was on a panel and kept getting questions myself along with the other men and women on the panel. We were being asked well, what if I'm away from my job for two years, for seven years, for five years? And I finally looked at the crowd and I said, wow, um, can I ask how many of you think you are going to want to leave your job for more than a year when you have children? 
and I ask all of you, what percentage of hands went up? Any guesses? I hear whispers. Anyone venture? 20%, 90 percent, 70%. 70% of the hands. And I said, wow, I really, really hope that can work out for you. But so far in my professional experience, I don't know of a large number of significant jobs where you can have a leadership role and pull out for multiple years at a time. So those things, either the world has to change a lot or this idea of the need to pull out needs to change. So at any rate, what we'd like to do um, in engaging you in this conversation is share what we learned in our research and then open it up to a conversation among all of us here. So as Stacey mentioned, we uh, did two kinds of research. Um, first, we surveyed the social science, everything from the research on uh, child development and child care, uh, research on marriages, research on the psychological well-being of men and women, organizational behavior research. A lot of that is written up in the 5050 fact sheet you have on your chair. You can look up the citations and happy again to talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. But let me come to something that struck us as most incredible as we read through all this social science. It seemed that a great opportunity we have in reframing this issue is to see a fact, which is that men and women really have more in common than we have differences as it relates to work and family. And if you look at the surveys, men and women equally poll as wanting change. 80% of dads for the last couple decades, working dads say they want more time with their kids. That is at least as high as the percentage of working moms who say they want time with kids. And people think that's because working moms in general feel they have more license to walk out and be with their kids, whereas working dads, due to cultural norms, don't feel that way. Secondly, uh, according to the National Institute of Mental Health and a number of other big research institutes, the idea that our dads or uncles or husbands or brothers need their careers more than our sisters and mothers um, and female friends is just wrong. <laughs> there is not scientific basis for that. It may feel that way. That may be the stuff of social lore. But if you actually look at the factors that predict long-term mental health and actually long-term physical health in men, they relate to strong relationships with family and that the men who suffer most in terms of physical stress and also mental stress are the men who have allowed the family relationships in their lives to break down. So it's an interest for all of us to allow men to invest in family just as we allow women to. So the other part of our research was going out and talking to working couples. We surveyed 1,100 working moms, and then we went and found uh, slightly over 200 men and women in dual career homes and asked them how they did it. We looked at people in all kinds of jobs in all different parts of the country. And three general messages came away for us. The first is Mindset makes all the difference. The way you frame and think about work and family determines whether it's easy for you or easier for you or really hard. And we'll talk about that in a second. Secondly, there is a game plan, a way of talking and acting that allows some couples to negotiate much more fairness in their marriages without a fight. This is not you know, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, that movie where the husband and wife, you know, shout at each other the whole time. This is about uh, finding collegial, fun, sometimes funny ways to talk with each other about stuff that is typically very emotionally laden, um, to take the emotion out of it so we can get to happier solutions. And the third point is that and when you take this back to work, happy working couples all seem to have some sense that they could control the norms in their 
office. And not all these people were super senior executives. Many of them were mid-level in their career, but they had some sense that they could innovate and change their job in some way to give themselves enough latitude so they could do what they needed to do for their kids. We're going to go into each one of those takeaways in a little more depth, but let me start first with this question of mindset. How you think about work and family drives everything. And again, all the details behind this section are embedded in that fact sheet you've got. The first thing we noticed in talking to all these dual career couples was they seemed uniformly comfortable with the idea that two working parents are actually good. Not a necessary evil, but good. Uh, and that they are good for kids and mothers. Um, and they're also good for dads and marriage. So we were very curious as we dug into the social science, you know, are they just optimists or is there a scientific basis for this? And it turns out there is a ton of research that supports this point of view. To begin with, uh, kids do equally well whether their moms work or not. How many of us knew that? Certainly not what I read in the newspaper. <laughs> um, but we had the opportunity to talk to uh, the leading social scientists at the largest universities in this country who all fed into something called the NICHD study of child care and child development, the largest ever study of child care and child development done in human history. It wrapped up in 2006. It sadly had a basically a uh, tiny PR budget. So what we read about it in the New York Times was not very informative at all. But if you go and talk to the lead researcher at Harvard who worked on that, or at University of California, or at University of Texas, or any of the big places that were involved, they will tell you the bottom line was there is no respected research that says female employment harms children. In fact, it may be the opposite. Um, when they look at the issue of um, depression versus well-being, there is a mountain of research that says when any of us pull away from employment, when we reduce the number of sources of self-worth that we have, we increase our risk of depression. Probably fairly intuitive that that would be the case. But they have documented what happens to women, not only in white-collar professions, but also in blue-collar jobs, when they pull back from the workforce and there's something like a 30% spike in risk of depression. Now, that's been in the psychology literature for a long time. Unfortunately, what we've gotten caught up in are little findings and little studies about daycare. And that is a legitimate thing to be concerned about, uh, but not if you're a parent and not if you're planning to pay attention, which I would assume everybody in this room does and plans to do. Um, and so I can talk about that later. But basically, the, the thing we came away with most um, excitingly was this idea that working mothers or working fathers, for that matter, had anything to feel guilty about. It just really had no rational basis. The third point here, though, I think is most exciting in terms of the idea of men and women working together as equals, because there are a number of studies that say how involved a dad is is a function of a mother's attitude, more than a father's attitude. So there are studies that say, if you give uh, men and women uh, opinion, attitude questions and, and ask, you know, what's maternal instinct? Do you believe in maternal instinct? Do you believe um, men are naturally fit to comfort an in infants? Do you uh, believe that women are more nurturing? Those sorts of questions. Women who hold a strong belief that they, as women, are naturally more able as parents and nurturers tend to have husbands who help less. On the other hand, women who are willing to believe that husbands are naturally as capable, that the raw talent is there, expressed or not, uh, those women have husbands who help more. And interestingly, they controlled for questions like, you know, how conservative is the husband? In the end of the day, the driving factor was what the woman believed. 
So how does this all play out for dads and marriage? So the very wonderful thing in bringing men into the picture of work and family is the research says men make a huge difference in outcomes for children. We spend all this time worrying about you know, maternal involvement, but the swing factor really appears to be paternal involvement. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the book about time diary studies where they've looked at the difference in time with kids of working moms versus non-working moms, and it's not a huge difference. But among fathers, the difference is massive. And it's mostly sort of you know, cultural, microcultural. So the good news is when dads are actively involved, they get dramatically better results for kids, even in two, career, two uh, parent families. Um, active fathers are seen as the driving determinant of things like better grades, more self-confidence, better behavior, more so even than moms. And part of the reason for this, again, gets to this uh, massive difference in the way men behave. There's a big Department of Education study that looked at 20,000 kids. And they found that among married couples, 73% uh, of fathers went to their child's school um, either twice a year, excuse me, yes, twice a year to never. And uh, wh whereas, you know, among working mothers, it was basically the opposite. But the interesting point was when dads got divorced, dads acted exactly like divorced mothers who were almost as involved as married mothers. So it's not that men's jobs keep them from going to school. It's the, the sense we have that if there is a mother around, she's taking care of it and that that's all good. And what the research says is it's better if we can make room for dads. So the other way this is all um, useful is it's, uh, the, the effect on marriage are also quite helpful. When we launched this book in the middle of the pit of the market crash, um, this second point, that two career bets are better than one, uh, was much less controversial than we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, the, the, the silver lining of what we've all been through in the last year is that it reminds us that in a world where men and women really are raised and educated to be more equal than not, um, we all have the ability to be pretty strong engines. And you have, if you have a choice of flying in a plane with one engine or two, what are you going to pick? <laughs> and particularly in a storm, it's awfully nice to have um, another functioning engine so that uh, if you get into a, a, a spot, you know, somebody, you know, one spouse doesn't like their boss, they can change, they can start a company, all those good things. But then the fun stuff is really this last point, which is more sharing equates to both lower divorce and more sex. Um, on the divorce side, in 2006, the University of Chicago Sociology Review uh, published what was a groundbreaking finding, and that is that couples in the United States who've gotten married since the mid-'80s, of that population, those with the lowest divorce risk are the couples that most evenly share earnings and housework. Now, that was a surprise to a lot of sociologists because historically the belief was that if a woman earned more money, that unhappiness was evenly distributed among couples. And if a woman earned more money, she could more easily walk out. So that a woman earning more money was thought to be correlated with higher divorce. Amazingly, no one bothered to look at the behavior of men. And when you actually look at the pools of government data that also look at how housework is divided and put that together with the earnings data, you find that when husbands do more around the house, whether or not their wives work, they dramatically cut divorce risk. But when you put those two things together, equal sharing in the housework and in taking responsibility for paying bills, that seems to be the most protective of marriage. Uh, but the, the one factoid that everyone likes the most when I go to largely male crowds, this gets me the largest guffaws, and that is there are tons of pieces of research from the child care and child development researchers to the marriage researchers who have found that 
Couples who report having the most sex, coincidentally, are the couples that report that the husband does the largest share of housework. So these good things go together no matter who's working. So if 50-50 is good for kids, good for marriage, good for men and women, um, how do we get more of it in our lives, given that uh, most parts of society don't set us up to do this successfully? If we pattern ourselves over the w after the way um, most, of, most couples work on television after our own parents, um, in all likelihood, it is going to be a little bit challenging to share as equally as we might want, it, want to share um, ideally. And uh, there's actually interesting research. There's some folks out at Berkeley who for the last 30 years have been studying couples, and they've come to the conclusion that no matter how liberal a couple is going into the process of having children, there is almost always some backsliding into traditional roles for a whole bunch of reasons we can talk about. And it would be fine if everyone was thrilled about the backsliding into traditional roles, but unfortunately it also correlates with a far higher degree of um, discord in the couple where people feel misunderstood and shoved into um, roles that they didn't intend to, the man feeling like he's not getting a lot of help, um, support, when he feels more pressured to earn money to pay for a baby and uh, the wife feeling like she's not getting enough support dealing with the grand chaos uh, that is early childhood. So here are three things that happy working couples told us. This is based on our interviews, but also um, from talking with the big marriage experts and negotiation experts. There's a whole section in our book um, from the authors of Getting to Yes, which you might recall is a big negotiation uh, classic. This is all very similar. And the, the first thing people told us they did was make a master plan. That the big problem people get into is we don't treat our home lives with as much respect as we treat uh, our office lives. You know, if you're having a conflict with the person in the next office over and you're working on a project, you're going to at some point say, hey, I need to sit down with you. <laughs> Let's figure out why this isn't working. Let's take out a piece of paper, a whiteboard, whatever. Let's write down what we need to do and how it's going to happen in a way that we can work well together. It's not that emotional a conversation. You just do it because it's for the good of the project. And what we heard happy working couples do more often than not was say, you know what? I was really pissed at you all week. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I'm going to say, you know, this week didn't work so well. Can we go grab a Starbucks and uh, take out a pad of paper and... Let's try to figure out what were the three things that went the most wrong and how is that not going to go wrong next week? And you know, they, would, they would treat it as a, as, you know, as a problem-solving activity. Um, the second thing was letting go. You know, when you're sitting there at Starbucks with your list, being willing to uh, throw aside things that your mother and great aunt or father might not. So, you know... Uh, my husband, golf games sometimes have to go. You know, in my case, elaborate kids' birthday parties sometimes have to go. And you know, I might emotionally fight. It's important. Our children care. And my husband will say, "Really? <laughs> I think our son just likes cake." So, you know, you, you, I think the, the concept is we have to be willing to to laugh about it a little bit. You know, in our Today Show appearance, uh, Joanna brought up this hysterical conversation we had with a man who indignantly told us, you know, my wife thinks you have to make hospital corners on every bed in our house every day before we walk out the door. It's infuriating. I don't like doing beds, period. You know, there are four beds in the house and, oh, you know, we just want to get our kids off to school with enough food to eat every day. And this is just not a good use of time. You know, why does that have to be, why do I have to accept that that's part of my to-do list? And we thought about it. And we're like, he's right. Why? You know, why, why does she get to make that call? And, and who would die if the beds weren't made? Certainly without hospital corners, no one would die. Um, so, so it's, again, giving men and women equal votes in the home in the same way we give men and women equal votes in the office. And the third point is I think we saw a lot out of um, 
happy working couples. They were motivated to share because it allowed them to escape this sense of guilt that we have heard talked about for way too many decades. That if you really know your spouse is interchangeable with you, it may be hard and sad to leave your child. Like last night, I had to leave my daughter in the middle of the day to get on a plane to come here. And she was not happy about it. She's five. Um, She was not happy about it until my husband came up and said, hey, let's go for a swim. And she's like, oh, goodbye. <laughs> she's like, and, and while I did feel bad that she felt bad that I was leaving, I also knew that she was now in the hands of a parent she loved as much as she loves me and was going to go do something really fun. And when we talked on the phone, it was going to be okay. But I think, I think very frequently um, when we see either mom and dad as having unique and um, very different qualities, it makes it harder to mix things up that way. So if we agree that this is, um, it can be good for, for families and it is doable in a constructive way, how do we bring 50-50 into the workplace? Uh, God knows I have never worked in a particularly uh, 50-50 environment. I have worked pretty much only in 24-7 environments. And uh, I know that you all work in something quite similar. So one of the questions we had to ask ourselves, particularly bringing this book out in the middle of a recession, is how can pro-parent be pro-profit? Is there a way of aligning those two values? And we came to the conclusion that, yes, there really is. Because a lot of the research we looked at comes straight out of the business schools. And I'm going to share just a few thought experiments with you. And you can think about how they might fit into your lives. But they are just examples of people doing things dramatically differently so that workers in high-stress jobs can take more control of their time. The first is... um, a case study from Harvard Business School that shows how much more metrics can free people up. In the late 1980s, Lehman Brothers was in uh, terrible shape in its research department. Their research department was ranked number 15 in the industry. It was a magazine called Institutional Investor, which is the only barometer of how you're doing. And Institutional Investor, or II as it was called, ranked them number 15. And, you know, you might as well close shop. (laughs) And so they brought up a guy named Jack Rifkin to turn the research unit around. And Rifkin was a very unusual guy. His view was, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time chatting with all the analysts and getting to know them and whatever else. I'm simply going to give them a list of metrics that I'm going to measure them on. And it's not just how good was your earnings estimate, how good was your EBITDA estimate, what have you, it's also all the different things that I think drive being a good analyst. How many times did you call the CEO, the CFO, uh, the suppliers, the clients, the salespeople who represent your research, the portfolio managers who read your research? How many special projects did you do for those portfolio managers? All these different things that drive performance in that job, Jack Rifkin was willing to put on paper and say, I'm counting for each one of you how you do. And by the way, if you want to come and spend hours schmoozing me in my office, that does not count. Uh, At the end of the day, you will be paid on this list and only that. The result was unbelievably dramatic. It was dramatic in the sense that they went from number 15 to number one in three years. By 1990, they were ranked number one by institutional investor. Everyone on the team, the percentage of analysts who were doing well jumped dramatically. But the most extraordinary thing was that the percentage of women who were ranked as top analysts by institutional investor went from almost none to 80%. Guys went from 20% to 40%. So it was good for everyone, but it was dramatically good for women. And the thought in these case studies is it allowed women to A, control their time and produce what was important, and that their contributions could be objectively evaluated. 
The second thing is um, uh, some research on fire drills and interruptions. Uh, there's a woman named Leslie Perlow who started her research at MIT, and she's now ended up as a tenure professor at Harvard Business School. And her whole uh, realm of study has been workers in technology and consulting and investment banking and trying to understand if there's a way to rethink how all we white-collar workers produce excellence. And one study that she looks at, she went to a high-tech firm and she said, I want the name of three offshore suppliers that produce exactly the same thing at exactly the same quality. And she ended up with a firm in China, a firm in India, and a firm in Hungary. And she sent a team of researchers to go and observe in each of those places. And while they were all producing the same thing at the same level of quality, she found they all did things differently, all with the sense that their way was the only way. So the folks in India worked a 14-hour day on average. Everybody, when people had questions, they go run around and ask each other questions because it was part of the culture to, you know, bond with your peers and exchange information. Um, very individualistic. In China, it was like study hall. It was, there was, everybody sat there quietly. There was a boss and there were the engineers and uh, they worked that way for eight hours a day and they were hugely efficient and they were producing as much per day as the folks in India working 14 hours a day. Go to Hungary. In Hungary, they had a, a much more fluid view of things that, you know, the cycle of every project went up and down and that their work hours would go up and down like this. And so on average, they were working something like uh, 10 hours uh, a day, but um, it was, it, it went, it, it peaked and troughed based on uh, when deadlines were. And there was a lot of sense that you could actually go home and get more work done from home. They had a lot of managers who were very supportive of that. So Perlow's view, and she's starting to do a lot of stuff in Harvard Business Review about this, is that you can go to a big management consulting firm or an investment bank, places where this is unthinkable, and say, you know what, you think that the only way to produce this kind of excellence is to be here 24-7 looking at it. Well, that's not right, because there are other people who do it differently and produce work of quality that is equivalent to yours, and they do it differently, and they allow people not to blow up their lives. So that, there is going to be, I think, a lot more of that uh, coming up in the business journals in the next couple of years. The last piece I'll talk about is sort of micro good process. Uh, there was one we interviewed who had been at Sullivan and Cromwell as an associate. And um, she had been offered a partnership role in a boutique securities litigation firm. And when she went to court the first day as the junior partner watching her senior partners, she was shocked because the judge at the end of the day turned to this, her new senior partner and said, uh, hey, um, I need you to file this by tomorrow morning. And her new senior partner said, um, your honor, we, we really aren't staff for that. Can you give us three days? And the judge says, sure. And this young woman from Sullivan and Cromwell said she almost fell over. She said, if you had tried to pull a stunt like that representing Sullivan and Cromwell, you would have been shot because that's just not the image Sullivan and Cromwell wants to have. If you say, yes, sir, when somebody, a judge, tells you to turn something in the next morning, you are not given the sense that you have the latitude to say, why? Why tomorrow morning? Why not in three days? But the material difference is, at her new firm, they do not need to run associates ragged. They can, from time to time they do, but they are much more thoughtful about when a deadline is truly overnight and when work can be spaced out in a more thoughtful way. So I just throw that out to you. So I'll just close with this. Um, this quote, every male CEO should have a working wife, was spoken by a former colleague of mine, Abby Joseph Cohen at Goldman Sachs. Uh, and it was spoken, I believe, in about 1996. And at the time, I was a uh, young VP at Goldman, and I was very inspired by it. What a nice thing. <laughs> Let's imagine the day when every male CEO has a working wife. And I'm afraid we're not that much closer to it today, 13 years later. Um, 
So while I, I believe she is correct that one of the things that needs to happen is that more people who get to make decisions about how we all work need to get what dual career life is about. But in the meantime, we have lives to lead, careers to succeed in, children to raise happily, and what are we going to do? Uh, and we come away thinking about three things. First is finding 50-50 friends and colleagues. You know, all the sociology research says it's so much easier to live the way you want if you have a buddy system. If you can find, not everybody has to be just like you, but you can find other people who support the way you live and help you uh, stand against norms that are unhelpful to your living the way you want to live. Secondly, knowing it's not 50-50 every day. You know, it's 60-40 or 90-10. That's not really the, the point, the actual split of, uh, you know, who does the dishes and the laundry and the kid pickup. It's really a mindset that says uh, dads need their kids and women need their jobs. And over the course of life, that should work out. And we think that more the people, all of us, change the dialogue about work and family and talk about these things and about the real facts about dual career families, uh, the more we will help people see that we can share the load between men and women, and we can change the way we work, and that will change the world. So with that, I am very eager to hear what your thoughts are. Thank you. Anybody? Thank you. Um, first, thank you for coming. And I'm sure my question is probably somewhere in the book, but one thing that my husband and I do is we keep scoreboard. And we always try to keep each other from doing this, where every weekend it's, well, how many diapers have you changed? And who did the grocery shopping? Are there any tips that you picked up from working parents, especially the time, whether it's at night or on the weekends, how to keep from going into scoreboard? How old are your kids? Two. One kid, two years old. Got it. So one thing I jokingly say is when our second child turned three, I told my husband I thought we had rounded the tip of Tierra del Fuego, you know, that very nasty part of um, South America where, like, boats crash into the side of the, <laughs> the cliffs and things like that. I, I think, you know, early, early parenthood is just exhausting. There's just way, way, way too much to do. Um, and so the survival of that period is, I think what's, what's very helpful to keep in mind is, is it's in the terms of a lifetime, it's short. So it will end, and then it gets a lot easier. Good to know. Um, but that said, a, a people said a couple of things. So I, I will tell you, with my husband and I, when our kids were really young, we truly had a two hours you, two hours me, two hours you, two hours me, because we felt it was just the right thing for our sanity. Like we could be great with our kids for a period of time. And, you know, maybe at hour four, we were still as cheery as at hour one. But typically if we could switch off, mm -hmm. the kids would get an up, happy, rested person. And then we could go do our work or we could go lie down or we could read a book, you know, in our, our times off. So that helped. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in the book, we do talk about um, a two-lawyer couple that actually had what they call the waking hour spreadsheet. And, <laughs> and it was more, you know, I think if you can have a sense of humor about it, yeah. uh, your know, scoreboarding is not terrible. Because, it, you know, it is, again, a period of a couple years where you are just, you know, being pummeled by the amount of work there is to do. Um, the other thing to think about is um, we periodically go through triage weekends. You know, we are dying. <laughs> what is on our list that has got to go? Like, what thing are we just going to agree we're just not doing? So one thing that's happened in our house, we, I, I recently discovered we had something like five photo albums that had either been given to us or we had purchased since having children. They are all empty. <laughs> we have umpteen, you know, Kodak gallery, O photo accounts. And I think we have just come, we have explicitly come to the agreement that when our children are tweeners and they can help, we'll do it together. <laughs> and between now and then, just forget about it. But I think, you know, everybody, for all of us, they're like little things that sort of nag at us and say, mm -hmm. we've got to do this, we've got to do this. 
and just ask yourself, is what would happen if you didn't do it? What would happen if you didn't do it? Because I think it's all about reducing the level of um, stress, which is a function of having this enormously long list of things that feel like they have to happen. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really helpful to just hear that it gets easier. Um, and I'm seeing as he gets more independent that it's getting easier, but it comes with a whole other side of things that have to get done. Um, but thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks for being here. And uh, it's a great lecture. And uh, well, I have a technical question. Uh, what if... Uh, what if scenario? So what if the, the wife is uh, more successful at the career? And uh, should the husband feel more pressured to get ahead or so, uh, work harder to get promoted? Or should he spend more time at home, like do more housework? So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, obviously every couple is different. Is going to look at this differently. Um, you know, my husband and I had a lot of conversations about this when we were dating. And I think... Um, you know, I, I, it's my view that we are lucky enough to live in a time when husbands and wives really do have access to great jobs. It's not a perfect world yet, but we have access to good jobs. So women actually, in a world where things are fair, um, if a husband and wife go into the same job, kind of 50-50 chance she's going to do better, Right. Um, and, and, you know, there is some statistic that says a third of women in married couples are more than their husbands, which is dramatically different than 20 years ago. Um, but I think the way we looked at it is long-term, who knows, right? She can invest her career in a fabulous company that, you know, turns out to be Enron or Merrill Lynch or, you know, a company that disappears. And um, so it's awfully helpful for both members of a couple to maintain their market readiness. Um, because you just don't know. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so I think what we found in talking to couples was you know, there certainly were times when one person's career was going better. And um, you know, it, it, I think there is social pressure for men if their wives' careers are going better. There are all sorts of weird vibes that can sometimes happen. And if men can rise above that and say, hey, this is great. <laughs> and, you know, I can help out more now. And, oh, by the way, I have ambitions too. There are other things I want to do with my life. And maybe there's not enough space and we don't have enough time for me to do them now. But how about in three years or five years or seven years, you know? One of the couples that I liked the most in the book were two doctors, and they very explicitly talked about baton passing, where she came out of medical school. She started into a job working three days a week, and he had a very big job, ultimately led part of a hospital. And after seven years, he was totally burnt out. He felt he wasn't going to see, getting to see his kids. And she was chomping at the bit, saying you know, she wasn't using her training in the way that she wanted to. Um, and she came back full time. He went back to 80, he scaled back to 80% time, though retaining his role as head of this piece of the hospital. And um, uh, she then became head of internal medicine at a very large hospital. So she's now working 70 hours a week, which is a little different than three days a week. Um, and he's doing much more around the house. But the idea is that over time, they'll go back and forth and, and allow each other to keep growing. Does that get to what you're talking about? Yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, this is definitely helpful. Um, I think part of uh, what my husband and I struggle with um, the whole thing is not having family around. And I'm not sure if you're going to talk about in the, if uh, the book talks a little bit about it. Just having that, aside from like friends, nothing is like family where you can kind of disconnect, take time out with your husband and kind of like, okay, let's learn, you know, what made us fall in love. And 
my sister is, um, you know, was telling me the other day, she was like, oh, I'm so in love with this guy that I'm going to marry. Go back to where you guys, when you used to date. And I, I'm just like, what? I just laugh about it. I'm like, I don't even want to think about that. But how much of family and having that closer network of support um, was important on the interviews you, uh, you had? Uh, so I think it is really important. That said, I think family can have two different um, aspects. But I think the thing that's important is support and support so that you have enough time with your spouse and you don't feel you're so overwhelmed that you can't remember what it was like in the first place. It's very easy to forget. um, The trick is sort of, you know, trying to, again, offload as much of the friction, the stress, and giving yourself as much time as possible. And I'll just tell you a funny story. Uh, So my sister has just had her, her second child is now um, 13 months old. And I was getting very worried because she was, I mean, she's just one of these very focused moms and she works full time and she just didn't appear to be sleeping at all to me. And so I was telling Joanna, my co-author about this. And I said, you know, I think I need to take Kira away. Um, she got you know, a weekend. She just needs to sleep. And Joanna looks at me and she says, your sister does not need a romantic weekend away with you. <laughs> <laughs> she needs a romantic weekend away with her husband. <laughs> So uh, my kids and I d- designed this, um, you know, camp for our cousins. So, and which was a tremendous amount of fun. Now we don't live close together. She lives in LA. I live in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she and her husband were game, and they came and they dropped the kids, and they got to go wander around in uh, Napa and have a nice weekend. But I, I, so I think you have to be. It's harder when your family isn't there. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, my mom very nicely sometimes comes out to look at the, after the kids. Sometimes we leave the kids in D.C. where she is. Um, you know, in the book we have couples who had their parents literally move in with them from out of the country while the kids were very young. And they talk about, well, yes, that was very nice because they got to sleep. There were also challenges of basically going back to your family of origin with that much closeness. The other thing people talked about was, in effect, coming up with um, pseudo family, you know, coming up with a bunch of other parents who have kids exactly the same age, whose parenting values you agree with, mm-hmm. um, so that, you know, it doesn't work very well when your child is one, but when they're four, you know, they can have sleepover at the Joneses. Yeah. <laughs> then, you know, the other parents can actually have a little bit of a, a rest, but, um, it, it does come up and it's challenging and there are alternatives. <laughs> But it will get better, right? But it will get better. <laughs> How old are yours? Uh, two. Two, yes. I know. <laughs> Age three, 36 Survive. months. <laughs> it's Thank coming. You. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about, about your views about uh, there seems to be a contrast between this two-engine view versus the two-income trap? And what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? So I have to say I'm quite befuddled by this two-income trap concept because as I understand it, it's this idea that somehow two very bright people could get themselves into a situation where they are spending a lot of money and then one person decides they don't want to work and then they can't stop spending that money and I'm just confused. (laughs) I'm just confused. I mean, I think... You know, if we are rational people, you know, what what I I think we talk about a lot in the book is um, coming to peace with and learning to talk about these decisions early and often and honestly. Um, Because I think if you do, you don't end up in situations like that. So, um, you know, a lot of times the research says that something like 84% of women who leave um, white collar jobs don't really mean to leave them. They don't leave because they want to. They leave either because they have uh, a misunderstanding with a direct boss who may have a very flexible policy but refuses to implement it or implements it in a way that feels alienating to the woman so she leaves. Um, Or they have a spouse who somehow conveys the idea or she accepts the idea that his career is more important regardless of whether or not he makes more money because of this belief that we talked about in the beginning that somehow careers matter more to men than to women. So if you haven't thought about all that to begin with, 
and you've built up a very expensive lifestyle, and then bing, you say, oh my God, I'm supposed to be home with my children because I read X, Dr. Laura says I'm supposed to, you're going to have a problem. But you know, I, I still don't find it so difficult for people to deleverage, right? <laughs> if, you're, um, it, you're, if you're a sensible person, you can sell the house, <laughs> you can uh, pay down the debt, you, know, you can do all these things. But I, I think it's all much easier if you think about it in the beginning um, because you know, my perspective is there's really no reason um, if you want to work that you, there's no reason you can't do it. Did, but am I answering your question or, or not really? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I don't think there's a right answer. I think it's in one case you have one person making all the money with none of these benefits, um, and, but there's only one point of failure there. And in the other case, you have two people making money, but that's two points of failure. But that's sort of redundancy, but then you have to readjust, and I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like there's a right answer, but I, I think you're right. You just basically have to, if you do your planning well and are willing to be flexible when things change, then that seems like the best you can do. Thanks. Yeah. That's good. Thank you for coming. That was sort of similar to my question. So along the same vein, I've seen a lot of more so friends. We're very fortunate at Google, so less colleagues. But you know, both people achieve all this advanced education and do all these things, and then get to the point where, from a practical standpoint, particularly I think living in places like the Bay Area or New York, um, and you know, more expensive living areas where there's a, a breakdown, not so much in maybe the communication between the couple, but in that okay, well, if we're going to have a nanny and how are we accommodating all these different things that there seems to be um, a point at which does this actually make sense for two people to be working when this is how much time we're going to have with our children and this is how much time we're going to be working and then, you know, when we break out the Excel, this is how much, you know, money we can put in savings and things of that nature. So I was wondering if you could just expand a little bit more on from a practical standpoint in terms of, you know, whether it's positioning um, sort of, like you said, passing the baton in terms of maybe a, working three days a week or just different strategies perhaps that you had learned from interviews about you know, ways to approach sort of in those early years and still being able to have both partners working. So yeah, great questions. And you know, the middle section, we have a book, um, we're in the, we have a chapter called um, Women Want to Work, Women Don't Leave Because They Want to. And there's a whole array of examples of women in demanding jobs who change the nature of them. A woman who runs part of engineering at a big tech firm who works from home a number of days a week for the last 12 years. Um, you know, people who do all sorts of creative and different things. Um, but the first thing I want to get to is this business about the economics calculation and childcare because um, we were, well, a lot of people who we've interviewed with have been like, you know, have been surprised when we say this, but if you actually do do the math and you are willing to look at anything beyond the first five years, it makes no sense for anyone to quit, period, right? Because like, even if you start out at a fairly low level, the power of compounding over a 30-year career is pretty big. Right. And so um, it, more, it overwhelms childcare costs. And then beyond that, then people say, well, how do you survive the short-term childcare costs? And that's really, I think, about being open-minded. And it's everything from, you know, there's a couple in our book who um, also worked at a high-tech company, and they were both doing very well. They asked to job share. So they, two, husband and wife, shared one job. Um, so they each worked three days a week. And um, the day that they were both at work, his dad, who had moved to be with them, looked after the child. So they had no child care, period, right? So that, that was a, an expense of zero, right? Um, there's a two-teacher couple um, who arranged their schedule with a principal so that they could hand off a child in the hallways. Not joking. <laughs> so there are people who do really inventive things. There are, you know, I'm sure we all have friends who are in less well-compensated professions where they, in effect, group, they have a group babysitter, in effect. They, you know, they, somebody finds a really talented person. They don't want the whole expense. They you know, bring in one or two other children 
so that you know you have or reduce by two thirds the you know, the hourly cost. So there really are ways of getting that cost under control if you are willing to see it as a worthy enterprise to be innovative about. I think people get very emotional. They, they, we, we, we are too fast to just switch it off and say, it's too hard, it's too hard, I give it up. And because, mostly because we believe the Dr. Laura arguments that somehow it would be better if mom were at home and we don't look at what the research really says. And so if we do know what the research really says, then it's much easier to say, oh, I should spend a little bit more time over here being inventive about, you know, how are we going to come up with a situation that we feel comfortable with, that's cost effective for us, and how are we going to look ahead and say, oh, yeah, in 10 years, we're going to be miles ahead of where we would be if one of us completely stopped out. Um, but to your question, you know, our argument is that we just want both men and women to feel they can keep a toe in while they have little kids because to knock all these smart people out of the workforce is crazy. It's crazy given you know, all the educational dollars that go into all of us. It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so how do you keep these people you know, continuing to build their skills, if at a slower rate? Um, and uh, we talk about a lot of companies, even law firms, that have um, kind of pushed themselves to get outside their, their normal frame. Like there's a guy who runs managing partner of a very large law firm. And he said he went into a partner meeting to talk about they'd had like five different failed uh, part-time programs. And everyone was like, oh, part-time, uh, whining women. They quit. Uh. And so, so they said, okay, it's not part-time. It's called modified hours. And some partner says, I need every associate working 150% on every matter I have. And the managing partner said, that's just baloney. <laughs> you have no, no associate working 150% on anything because every associate here is at least on four matters. So at best, you've got 25%. So what do you care if you know, the other 75% or 25% is spent at home? You should not care. All you care about is that the time you have the associate, they're really, really good. And so it, a lot of it gets to sort of, you know, not just workers changing the way we think, but, but managers sort of getting out of this um, sort of anti-communist uh, mindset that we have that makes it really hard to have to innovate and, and, and come up with creative solutions. Great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Uh, 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 it seemed to me that at one point you were kind of, uh, um, uh, you were implying that there's a lot of value in having equivalent income of the husband and wife. Uh, 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 my wife say preschool teacher, um, and she always wants to work with the children. This is what she really enjoys. Uh, there's no way that she'll, she'll ever make even a third of what I make. Um, so uh, how important is it that husband and wife make the same kind of money? Uh, how, do, how do I uh, come to a 50-50 agreement with my wife uh, in this this kind of circumstance. I agree. So, so let me explain. So the study that I was talking about, you know, is that that that's just sort of one of the data points in the study. Um, and the thing that was more important was the husband contributing more equally to the housework. That was actually that was a that was a bigger deal than okay. equivalence of, of of income. So, and what the marriage research really says is about having mutual respect which is easier when you can both have a sense of what the other person's up against. So if you have some sense of what it's like for her to go and teach every day and not get paid that much for it, you know, it's easier for you to support her in that. It's easier for her to support you in long hours at Google when she has a keen sense of what that's like. I mean, you know, you know that. Um, so I think what the marriage research says really more than anything else is that if we can throw aside this idea that men's careers come first and that no matter what a person earns, it is important for them to be involved in something outside their family, that that's what the psych research says. Um, and oh, by the way, it's important for both parents to be engaged with their children. Um, then you can sort of mix it up. But we interviewed a lot of people where the husband was in business or a big lawyer or whatever it was and had a wife who was... Um, a teacher or a professor or worked in nonprofit um, and had them talk about why their wife's career was valuable to them. 
you know, what it brought to the marriage that she was doing stuff that they thought was valuable. And, and just sort of one of the funny stories that I love, um, we were at a panel and one of the people on the panel was talking about how uh, her stepdaughter was a public school teacher and that she quote unquote had to quit because her uh, income did not cover childcare. And the woman sitting next to her was a technology executive with three children. And she just started laughing and she said, my husband teaches at a private school. I guarantee he makes less than your stepdaughter working at a public school. Can you imagine if I went home and said, sweetheart, you don't make enough to cover our childcare. You thought about quitting? That just isn't going to happen, right? I mean, so we're, we're much more logical when we think about men and the value of their careers than we are when we think about women and the value of their careers. And so one of the things that we kept feeling was, why can't we be more logical when we look at, at women and the value of their careers? Thank you. Anybody else? Thanks very much.